With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello there. How are you? It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be a part of this program, someone who wants... To be on the program is Tim. You are up next. Welcome. Thank you. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? Good. Going back to what we were talking, you were talking about earlier about Harvard and uh, races. What I mean, if you look at today's society, the government itself, everything they want to do is either made about race or is racial outcomes are based on it. I mean. Today, they're, you know, they're talking about the Supreme Court nominee. Instead of just saying, we're going to pick the best person, you know, they call out, we're going to have a black woman, period. I mean, that comes across the affirmative action, somewhat racist. Uh, it, I went in the military in the early 80s. And when I went in for our entrance exam, as a Caucasian, we had a certain score we had to reach. A uh, black male had a lower score, and then a Hispanic male had a lower score than that. And so to say we're all equal, they broke it out by race as to what we had to score to get in. I mean, our government as a whole is what perpetuates the systematic racism they all want to talk about. That's what I think. I'll You're right. Your and uh, not only that, it, it perpetuates doubts, uh, envies, resentments uh, along the way. It's deeply frustrating from my vantage point that uh, we are in this sort of situation in the United States. I don't find it helpful. I I, I find it degrading. And, and there will be people who say, well, you're a white dude. It's true. I am reflectively white. How about that? I don't wear white socks because if I put them on, I'm so white, I can't find them to take them back off. I'm white. I get it. But to make presumptions about me based on my race is as racist as you making presumptions on someone who's not white based on their race. You, You don't know me. What the critical theorists do, what the intersectionalists do, is they lump us into categories based on our race, sex, gender, if you believe in separating the two, and they do, religion, ability or lack thereof, and they presume that based on that, we are defined in a certain way. They don't, they don't know me. They don't know you, but they say, well, you're, you're white, you're male, you're cisgendered, which is one of the stupidest terms ever, but it means that uh, you're, the way you identify equals your sex. So you're a man who believes he's a man. You're not crazy. So you're, you're white, you're a non-crazy man. You don't have a disability. You're Christian. You live in the South. Well, you are the most privileged among us. And so your life must be grand and glorious. There are a lot of presumptions made. I know people who are not white, who grew up way wealthier than me, went to more prestigious institutions, have way more privilege than me, but when you check the boxes on all of this, no, no, actually, sorry, uh, you are, you're are you still the oppressor and they're the oppressed. That's the way critical theory works. 
and all it does is it feeds it feeds resentment. There can be no reconciliation when you're lumping people into boxes based on their class and race. You can't have any sort of reconciliation. You're dividing people up based on the color of their skin. Y'all do understand how this works, right? It's been a while since I've explained this. Uh, but the critical theorists, they believe in something called intersectionalism. And so you're, all of these all of these categories, you're, you're lumped in. And when you get into these categories, there's a presumption of uh, the, the, the dominant and the inferior. And so if you're a white, male, Christian, straight, heterosexual, cisgendered, uh, no disability, no handicap, you are the most privileged, and as a, as a result, you are considered dominant. And the way to subvert society and make the people who are non-white, uh, non-straight, non-cisgendered, non-Christian, what have you people, uh, non or handicapped people, make them the dominant one is to subvert the dominant discourse. Now, I used to hear people say this phrase, and I didn't know what it meant. What is subverting the dominant discourse? You got people out there with the, the bumper stickers, subvert the dominant discourse. What is it? Well, it means that the, the white dudes have to shut up. And if they won't shut up voluntarily, you've got to use the power of government or the mob to shut them up. Critical theorists, intersectionalists, postmodernists, they don't believe in free speech because they believe that words define reality. If words define reality, how is reality real at all? Well, they say reality is not really real. It depends on the words. And so if you can shut up the dominant discourse, you can use new words to define society. Where, where the dominant white person may say, well, yes, there's racism, but it's not that bad. Shut up. Shut up, whitey. You crackers better shut up. No, instead, no, everything is racist. The system itself is racist. It's systemic racism. The very system that society is formed around is racist. And don't you contradict me because you're white. You're not allowed to have any input on this because you have too much privilege. That's how they set it up. You can't win the argument because it's pre-designed for you never to be able to win the argument because it is pre-designed for you bigots to realize you're a privileged oppressor. And the privileged oppressors must be quiet. But there's no way for reconciliation in this case. Because what happens when those who subvert the dominant discourse become dominant, well, then you got to subvert this their discourse. And what the critical theorist says, well, actually, we'll get to a balancing point. We'll get to a balancing point where the people of no privilege will have a little and the people of all out of privilege will have some taken away and everyone will be happy. There ain't no way that's going to work. There's this thing called sin. And it's in all of us, whether you believe it or not. And there's no way. We're going to get rid of this without some level of reconciliation that involves something other than reading Hannah Nicole Jones's revisionism of the 1619 Project about American history, where this woman is an idiot who knows very little history, and you're not allowed to say that. Otherwise, you're a racist for calling her what she is, an idiot. And it shapes all of our understanding now to the point where uh, we have people defending racism in the name of affirmative action that just seeds more doubts and, and causes more brokenness in society. And now you got the president of the United States saying only a black woman can get on the Supreme Court, which immediately questions her core competencies. Even if she shouldn't, it will because the president didn't view her as the best, just happened to view her as the best black female. That's a problem. Now, let us go to the phones. David, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the program. Always a pleasure, young man. Um, Thank you. One thing I'm, I'm, I've noticed, um, I am of the race you were just making reference to, and yeah, one thing I've noticed is this, the racism is taught, okay, and from what I see. Because, like, you had mentioned previous before that you, you have black friends, you have green, whatever color friends. You, everybody has friends of different color. It's how you treat the person. It's not the, your skin color. 
and I've been called a cracker numerous times. I don't let it get to me. But but the yep. uh, the point is that until it's stopped and the right message is sent, like it's a uh, critical theory. I mean, come on, really? That's going from one extreme to the other. But anyway, I just want to touch base with you on that. Yeah, Thank it, you. Well, it's always a pleasure listening to you. David, I appreciate the phone call. Yeah, uh, critical theory teaches that. It, it, full disclosure, I, I, I don't have green friends uh, except when I'm visiting Mars or, or I go to Denver and eat those weird mushrooms in the restaurants. Then then suddenly, I mean, I got I got stained glass colored friends, apparently. <laughs> I kid. I kid because I care. Yes, but friends, red, yellow, black, and white. I uh, got fr- friends all over the world. I've got friends in the Middle East. And you know what? They would all prefer to live here. I've got friends who immigrated here from other countries, and, and they say this place is so screwed up because of the wokes, but it's still better than anywhere else. The only people who seem to have real grievances about this country are either the like third generation immigrant family members who have gotten cushy in their their liberal enclaves and uh, the natives got people literally flooding across the southern border to get to the United States of America, most of whom want to come here for a better life. And then you got the, the natives here who hate the country. I mean, you got the ESPN analyst. Do I have this audio still? I think I've got this audio. Had the ESPN analyst the other day who said he couldn't condemn China because of all the problems in this country. Really? We can't condemn China because of problems in the United States. J.A. Adani, as a fan and then as a reporter, how do you reconcile and join this competition while also considering everything I just said? I think it's standard in sports right now. You have to have a cognitive dissonance. You need to compartmentalize. We've never had a more enjoyable NFL playoffs in this country, and we've never had more people watching the playoffs, and yet it goes on amid the ongoing allegations against Dan Snyder, owner of the Washington football team, and the, you know the continuous concussion concerns, and now the concerns about diversity and the allegations and the questions about competitive integrity even, all of that, and yet we're still enjoying the games. and. Who are we to criticize China's human rights records when we have ongoing uh, attacks by the agents of the state against unarmed citizens and we've got assaults on the voting rights of, of our people of color in various states in this country? So sports, I think it is possible and it's necessary more than ever to just shut everything out if you are to enjoy the actual games themselves. Wait a second. Because Georgia passed a voting law that turns out actually makes it easier for people to vote. We can't condemn China for running concentration camps. Do you, do you see what's happening here? Do you, do you see this? That that because this country does this thing I don't like, I can't condemn China for committing genocide. That's not a sane person, but that's a progressive, and so many of them believe this these days. Um, it, moral relativism. You know, there are things that this country does that this country should not do. We are not a perfect country. We're a country full of sinners. But that does not mean we can't condemn genocide. We have gone real quick from never again to, yeah, I'll just watch the games out of one eye. It's not the way to have a healthy society. Hi there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Um, not to do a segment on religion, but the former Pope, the Pope Emeritus, Benedict the Sixteenth. I am not Catholic. I know many of you are. He's released a letter in response to an independent report on the handling of sex abuse allegations in the German Archdiocese of Munich. Uh, he had been uh, the bishop there from 1977 to 1982 while some of this was going on. And it is a deeply apologetic letter. And it is, I, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really shocked that a public figure would, would do this. And it's just, it, it's beautiful. It should be a lesson for so many people here. In all my meetings, especially during my many apostolic journeys with victims of sexual abuse by priests, I have seen at first hand the effects of a most grievous fault. And I've come to understand that we ourselves are drawn into this grievous fault whenever we neglect it or fail to confront it with the necessary decisiveness 
and responsibility as so often happens and continues to happen. And in those meetings, once again, I can only express to all the victims of sexual abuse my profound shame, my deep sorrow, my heartfelt request for forgiveness. I have had great responsibilities in the Catholic Church. All the greater is my pain for the abuses and the errors that occurred in those different places during the time of my mandate. Each individual case of sexual abuse is appalling and irreparable. The victims of sexual abuse have my deepest sympathy, and I feel great sorrow for each individual case. I have come increasingly to appreciate the repugnance repugnance and fear that Christ felt on the Mount of Olives when he saw all the dreadful things that he would have to endure inwardly. Sadly, the fact that in those moments the disciples were asleep represents a situation that today, too, continues to take place and for which I, too, feel called to answer. And so I can only pray to the Lord and ask all the angels and saints and you, dear brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Quite soon, I shall find myself before the final judge of my life. Even though, as I look back on my long life, I can have great reason for fear and trembling, I am nonetheless of good cheer, and I trust firmly that the Lord is not only the just judge, but also the friend and brother who himself has already suffered for my shortcomings and is thus also my advocate, my paraclete. In light of the hour of judgment, the grace of being a Christian becomes all the more clear to me. It grants me knowledge and indeed deep friendship with the judge of my life and thus allows me to pass confidently through the dark door of death. In this regard, I'm constantly reminded of what John tells us at the beginning of the apocalypse. He sees the Son of Man in all his grandeur and falls at his feet as though dead. Yet he, placing his right hand on him, says to him, Do not be afraid. It is I. That's the former Pope, the Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, acknowledging his failures in dealing with sexual abuse in the Catholic Church and, and begging the congregation for forgiveness, acknowledging he is near death and justice awaits. I got to tell you, take the religious, take the topic, a public figure begging for people's forgiveness sincerely. We don't see that in public a lot. We don't see a recognition of the harm caused. We don't see a, a recognition of an abdication of prior responsibility and an embrace of it now. We don't see an apology. We don't see any of this in public from, from people. Look at Stacey Abrams in the mask. Stacey Abrams could have come forward the other day and said, you know what, I screwed up, I'm sorry. Instead, what we saw was a, a vicious attack from Stacey Abrams against her critics, and only after 48 hours of the media, her media, the media that loves her, criticizing her, did she come out and say, I apologize. And then she moved on. Rarely do we see sincere apologies from politicians. Rarely do we even see concessions anymore from politicians who lose races. This is this is remarkable in that light. For, forget what it's about if you can. Forget who wrote it if you can. Maybe you shouldn't. Pope. I'm Presbyterian. And even I get the significance of the Pope. Emeritus, granted. But still, how refreshing is it to see a figure come forward and say, these things happened. I dropped the ball. I'm responsible because I neglected the duty. There's nothing I can do to make this right. And I am very, very sorry and ask for your forgiveness. Now, in today's politics, if he were running for office, would be excoriated and vilified for daring to apologize, which is why no one wants to apologize because no one wants to offer grace or forgiveness. They want to use the apology as a bludgeon. But still, you should apologize when you screw up, whether people forgive you or not. That's on them. That's not on you. And it's remarkable to see a leader do something like this, particularly in this day and age. So good for him. God bless him. Uh, pray for him, whether you're Catholic or not. I'm here. I forgot. Don't eat a protein bar during a five-minute commercial break because you can't chew those damn things up quick enough. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ah. All right, I can move on. Sorry, y'all. I'll, Chris, be patient with me. I'm going to confess. I get hangry. Y'all, I'm a very nice, calm, 
relaxed, very laid back person. It takes a lot to get me exercised about things until I'm hungry. And then there is this monster who lives within me. Those of you who are my good friends who are out there can attest to this fact that I become the raging a-hole you all would despise. I get hangry and I get like evil mean. It's, yeah, I mean, like I recognize it and I've, I've known it, it, it runs in my family. And I know some of you say, well, I, I get hangry. I, I know some of you are out there like, I get hangry. No, no, no. No, like I become a violent, raging, awful person. When I get, it, it, it is so bad that when I take trips, my assistant, Candace, has to put on other people's calendars, remind him to eat because it becomes very not good. It is, and it's a total blood sugar thing. I realize it. My father is the same way. My sisters are the same way. Neither my father's nor like, I don't have a temper. It takes a lot to make me very bad. Y'all, I have been through some poop in my life and I can be very even killed. And you know, it plays well with my wife where when she gets fired up about something, I generally don't. When I get fired up about something, she doesn't generally. And so we balance each other out in that way. Um, one of the, the great benefits of marriage, but y'all, when I get hungry, it's not good. It is never a good thing. It, it is it is a really awful, awful thing. I generally have to carry a protein bar, a snicker bar, something. I would rather the sugar crash than the hanger because it is the in un, uncontrollable, incredible rage. You just, you, you, you can't, you don't understand. I'm just confessing my sin here. So I needed, I had to have that protein bar and it had to happen those last five minutes, even though it takes about six minutes to chew one of those suckers down. All right, we're going back. Y'all don't care. Chris, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the program, Chris. Hey, how are you, Eric? Great. What's going on? Oh, it's funny. I understand your hangry scenario. My girlfriend, she suffers from uh, <laughs> food panics. If, it's, if there's not food within 10 minutes of any time and place, she's, uh, you know, she's DEFCON 4. But anyway, uh, yep. I thought about... Uh, you were talking about, you know, the CRT and the racism and all, and, that we, you know, this is nothing new, but there's something that uh, it sticks out with me, and it's an issue that I've been focused on for years. I was 15 years ago a liberal myself and somehow managed to claw and scrape myself intellectually through that mud and see the error. But what I think conservatives fail to, fail to understand and maybe understand the importance of it is for the future of conservatism to exist, in, in, the, in the long run, we're going to have to understand how to talk to young people in, in a way that expresses to them the value of individualism over the collective response. Everything about the Democratic Party is based on collectivism, the group. There's no such thing as the Democratic Party without some kind of group defining jail between people. There's no such thing as the individual. So they can't conceive of what we're talking about because – that's the baseline. That's the default mechanism. You have to actively seek out the, the higher intellectual thought processes of individualism and, and individual liberty. And we are at a huge disadvantage because they don't understand any of that. And we approach them. Sometimes we approach them from a collectivist point of view ourselves and we lose and we're going to start losing more. And that's what keeps me awake at night as a parent. And that's uh, really what I had to say. So thank you for your Well, yeah, you know, so Chris, let, let me tell you, um, yeah. one of the, the most dangerous phenomena I see in politics right now is there's a growing movement on the right for a collectivist right movement, uh, which I think is a Absolutely. horrible idea. Um, and a lot of the national populist guys believe that for the collective good of society, government should impose our values on the rest of society instead of propping Great. up the individuals. And it, I, I just find that as dangerous. And you're so right uh, that the group thing that's out there, it's a problem. Um, you, you know, for example, I, I, I do have to say this. There was a study I read once that uh, every generation of kids tends to do things differently. And you see cycles right. in society where – uh, the, the, like classes go through lots of group work and then it's small group work and then it's partners. And we've arrived at the age of the current kids in school. And my kids tell me this at their school where kids simply don't want to work together. 
And I can't wait right. for those kids to become voters because they're the they're the true individualists. But yeah, we've gone through this thing in, in school and the like. It is it, we're we're teaching kids a level of collectivism. Now I, I got to say this, and, and I'll let you go there. I, I appreciate it. Uh, we we won't tell your girlfriend what you said about needing to be within ten minutes of food at all times. <laughs> but I get it. I get it. We sometimes. Sometimes we sometimes elevate the individual too much. We, we do sometimes elevate the individual too much. There can be a level of idolatry in individualism. I would rather, however, err on the side of individualism than err on the side of the collective. And the collective out there particularly from the left, isn't really the collective. It is a group of technocrats that get to decide what's best for everybody. I believe in the free market. I don't think our market right now is free enough. In fact, I think what has happened in Washington is that the millionaires, billionaires, a status quo have gamed the system to preserve the status quo and the innovators can't get ahead. I read an interesting theory recently, and it makes a lot of sense to me. In the 14, 1500s of the Renaissance, one of the reasons for the Renaissance and the growth of the Enlightenment was war and the need for technical advantage. And with the need for technical advantage, governments decided they needed to start funding the innovators instead of the status quo. Well, when you fast forward, uh, new monopolies rise and new status quos develop. And the people who were the innovators want to protect their innovations and become the new status quo. And the industrial revolution came about. And by the way, there had been steam engines that had been invented in the past. And the rulers of the day in Europe were like, well, we can't have this. What do we do with the unemployed when we put them all out of work? The word sabotage is widely believed to come from a French word during the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution where the French wore wooden shoes called sabots, like the, the, Dan or the Dutch clogs, and they would clog up the, the works. They would shove the sabots into the, the gears and commit sabotage. They wanted to preserve the status quo. And Great Britain was building an empire. And the British, who had been preserving the status quo, shifted to prop up the innovators. And as Britain shifted the innovators, the innovation in the Industrial Revolution came out of Great Britain and spread into the American colonies and the United States. And as the United States was gaining its foothold in the world, the United States started funding new innovators, funding new concepts, funding things like the, the, the land rush of Oklahoma and the like to spread people out around the country as the country grew and, and we were embracing technology and unfortunately, we've gotten to a point now where a lot of that technology is, well, it's the status quo now. And the status quo wants to be preserved. And our laws, our tax code, our regulations, they tend to benefit the status quo. That's why, look, I, I, I know Mark Zuckerberg, uh, not well, but I know him. And, and I know the folks at Facebook. And I actually think more highly of them than probably many of you do. I think they've been far less hostile to conservatives than other social media outlets. Uh, but I'm real leery of Facebook showing up to Congress saying, hey, look, we agree we need a little regulation here. Use these regulations because inevitably those regulations will make it hard for an innovator to innovate to compete. And what the innovators are doing now is they're using regulation to preserve the status quo. And in preserving the status quo, they're preserving their leads and making it hard. And we should, by default, always side with the disruptors and the innovators. In a free market, the creative destruction of the marketplace makes for a better marketplace. Now, how do I get from individuals versus collectivism to the marketplace? Well, when the government and the technocrats and the mob decide 
what's best for the collective. The collective never settles on the great unknown. The collective is collectively risk adverse. And what happens is you wind up propping up your status quo. And in propping up your status quo, the other, the individuals, the people who value the individual, the people who value individuality, they back the disruptors. They back the people with the new ideas. And eventually they become dominant. And then one day they, they, instead of dying the hero, they live long enough to become the bad guys who want to preserve their status quo. And the cycle repeats itself. And the the good governance requires that we value the individuals because the values of the individual outweigh the values of the collective. And when individuals compete against each other, they wind up inevitably throughout the history of mankind doing things in their competing interests to benefit themselves that ultimately benefit the collective without the technocrats ever getting involved. It's one reason I'm in the camp that believes China is on the decline, not the rise. The history of totalitarian regimes throughout mankind's history are that their innovators are scared. When you get below the superficiality of China, you find that a lot of stuff doesn't work as well as advertised. They launched a big aircraft carrier last year, much fanfare, their biggest aircraft carrier ever. Their most technologically innovative had a reactor meltdown. It was on fire within 24 hours. A lot of Chinese buildings are empty. Their real estate portfolios of these companies over there going bankrupt. China's high-speed rail system collapsed. It's had dams that have cracked and, and settled badly. And why? It's because the Communist Party always preserves the collective. The collective always preserves the status quo. And anyone who tries to disrupt the status quo gets killed in a communist regime. And so no one wants to speak up. No one wants to be the innovator. No one wants to be the guy who says, wait a second, we went too fast and we laid the footing on the bridge wrong. I think China's on the decline. Now, being on the decline makes China even more dangerous than being on the ascent. But it all goes back to the collective versus the individual. And I think it's a a, a deeply dangerous thing for people on the right to start embracing the idea of collectivism because they think it's worked for the left and say, you know what, we're going to have a right-wing collective. It's going to be a a Christian society of sorts, and we're going to impose our values on everyone as opposed to just leaving everyone the hell alone and let everyone decide what's in their best interest. Now, the left won't leave well enough alone and wants to impose their values on everyone as well. And frankly, their values are kind of the default. Secularism is a religion. Whether you believe it or not, secularism is a religion. It is the default religion of progressives, and they have gotten the Supreme Court of the United States to embrace it. But we have a 6-3 conservative majority now on the Supreme Court that kind of gets secularism is in and of itself making the choice of a religion as opposed to barring the establishment of any religion. We've got to side with the disruptors, with the individualists, with the rugged individualists of the United States. Yes, you can make an idol of it. Yes, you can overcorrect and overcompensate in favor of the individual. And sometimes you do have to do things for the good of society. We've we've been juggling this in the pandemic of how should things work? How how do how do we balance the goods of the individual and the goods of society? And I think we've probably overcorrected too much for the collective, and now we're starting to swing back to the individual. Always err on the side of the individual, even when you're getting it wrong. Ultimately, you'll get better results than when you side with the collective. You just will, because individuals compete against each other in a free marketplace, and they do things that are in their best interest. And ultimately, annihilationism is not in the best interest of the individual when sometimes the collective decides other portions of the collective should be annihilated, and we get bad things. Individuals disrupt society. Disruption leads us to better society and technical advance. Collectivism is always too scared to innovate lest they disrupt the collective. That's why communist regimes can't compete against capitalist regimes. But we forget that. And we're raising a bunch of kids who are embracing a collectivism in this country that uses government to preserve a status quo that no longer really works for a lot of people And we should, as a society, rethink that. Hi, it's Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Let's go to the phones. Michelle, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the program. 
Hey, Eric. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. I was hoping to chime in. I want to chime in on race and the problem that I have personally uh-huh. with the whole quote unquote white privilege. Uh, you know, you talked before, you know, you're white, your life is so grand and you don't even have a say about anything. But my message is that white people go through some pretty terrible things also. And just because our skin is white doesn't mean we have privilege. Um, for example, I have three kids all by adoption. They're white also. Um, they came from a very poor white family, alcoholic dad, drug addicted mom, um, suffered abuse in so many ways. Can't even imagine, but physical, you know, mental, sexually. Um, and then on top of that, after they came to live with my husband and I, uh, my husband at the time was murdered at work. Um, so as a result of many things from their past, uh, whether they were white or not, or not, um, my kids really struggle with some serious mental health issues. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not allowed to even balk at the concept of white privilege because I'm white. And it's very frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, it should make you angry, uh, given the background. My gosh, uh, my uh, sympathies for your loss there. It, it, a compelling story, and and for you to to have these kids and to raise them. It, it, that's my problem. You hit on it with the whole idea of privilege and critical theory. Is it looks past you to your skin color and makes presumptions about you and your life that aren't valid presumptions should never be considered valid presumptions. And in a sense, uh, takes from you uh, your story and your history and makes it something that's not so that other people can actually look at their story and still feel worse than you and say, well, you have privilege. It, it's it's appalling okay. that we in society would go along with this. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for the phone call. That's the problem with the word privilege. And by the way, how do they define privilege? Your parents are divorced. You busted your butt to get through school and got a good education. All the things that should be and were done are somehow now privileged as opposed to either a blessing or a product of hard work. No, no, you're privileged. You're not really privileged. They're they're using this phraseology in a way to make it sound like you got something and it's it's somewhat unfair, you got some sort of benefit. No, it takes a lot of hard work to keep a marriage together. It's a product of compromise. It takes a lot of hard work to get your college degree. Sometimes your parents had to bust their butts to get you to a private school because they were in a you were in a failing public school. That's not privilege. That's hard work and commitment in ways that other people may not be able to have, but you were blessed to have, and you shouldn't be condemned or made to feel guilty for your parents doing the things they could. Uh, It essentially forces us to judge each other where we're not supposed to be judging each other in those sorts of ways. It's, It's a dangerous philosophy that's seeking into our society, and so many people get to feel victimized because of it. It's 2022. Things are still crazy. Things haven't settled down. And now you got the Federal Reserve and interest rates. You got the economy. You got inflation. A lot of banks won't even return your phone call. Let's say you're a small business and you need a loan for $750,000 or higher. You see an opportunity where banks, they don't even want to see you. You want to buy a building. You want to build a building. Reach out to the Frost family at First Liberty Building and Loan. They've been helping small businesses become big businesses since the 1990s. They want to help you if they can. So spend 10 minutes with them. See if you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Their website is firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. Again, you need a loan, $750,000 or higher. You're a small business and you see an opportunity to grow. Share it with the Frost family and see if they can help you. Firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. First Liberty Building and Loan can help businesses nationwide become bigger businesses. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.